When we launched My Life in Four Trades, we'd hope we hear some great stories from successful investors and maybe get a peek at what made them so good at their jobs. What we ended up getting was so much more profound. These world-class investors dug deep and shared the lessons they've learned. From their success, yes, but more importantly, from their mistakes. And the interesting thing? What they liked talking about the most was their failures. The more conversations we taped, the more we noticed some common themes coming up. So with the permission of our guests, we decided to tap our friend, performance coach Denise Schull of the Rethink Group, to help us pull apart some of the wisdom that's been shared. So sit back and enjoy what is sure to be a fascinating conversation. We have two competing needs. One is to like be fully ourselves and reach our potential. And the other is to be part of a group and accepted and loved and they're in conflict. And so we're always navigating those two. And the market, honestly, is the perfect place to navigate those two. <laughs> Hi, Denise. Welcome to My Life in Four Trades. Hey, Maggie. Happy to be here. So you and I have done a couple of Real Vision events together, and the last one was in California. And in between sessions you were doing, you heard me tape an episode of this podcast live. And I think these kind of conversations are right up your alley, aren't they? They are. Yeah, they are. So before we jump in, and we're going to take um, kind of a deep dive with one of the conversations, one of the early conversations um, with Hugh Hendry. And um, but but before we do that, uh, why don't why don't you sort of tell us about uh, your approach um, and and some of the ways that you come across? You know, you deal with clients, and particularly, um, you know the way you think about using the science of the brain to try to help people with their performance. Just give us a little idea of your approach. Yeah. In short, it would be called neuropsychoanalysis, but it's not like anybody knows what that means. Um, so that's, it's really a combination of the latest neuroscience of how a human actually makes a decision and a number of principles that honestly psychoanalysts have known forever, which is most of our perception and judgment is unconscious. Uh, so I apply this to like risk decisions. I mean, all decisions are risk decisions, but market decisions are a particular type of risk decision. But what the latest science has shown is all decisions come from an emotion and like, okay, you know, don't stop listening right now. Cause it's true. <laughs> and particularly <laughs> an expected emotion, but the vast majority of this is unconscious to the vast majority of us. So what I do is help people make that conscious so they understand what factors are really driving their decisions. And when they become conscious of it, they like have a wider set of choices. It's so interesting because as you're saying that, one of the things that, I mean, I think we've taped 16 conversations now. And at some point, almost everyone says, well, I, I, you have to take the emotion out of it. You have to, I try, I have to separate the emotion or the bad trades, the worst trades they've had. I let my emotions get the best of me. And and I know we've talked about this, and I've done a sessions with you on stage, and this it's almost exactly the opposite of what you just described, which I think is so fascinating. Yeah, I, there's this you know centuries old misunderstanding that like in, feeling something and doing something are the same thing. So. Because it's like it's been merged and people haven't looked at it logically. I mean, an emotion alone, an emotion alone has never lost or made a dime. Like you have to do something, right? You have to put the order in. Um, and people don't separate that. So, you know, since at least the 1600s, there's been this, you know, Descartes, I think, therefore I am. And it's it's literally the exact opposite of how the brain actually works. So the the, the wrong perception of it, if you will, actually just makes the whole thing worse. It makes it more likely that any given individual merges their emotion and their action as opposed to analyzing what information's in the emotion and then assigning that information like to the trade or to their life or to their history. They don't do that because they don't, well, they don't know that they should. And I mean, I always think it's like a flat earth, round earth thing. You know, when the earth was flat, no one thought they could sail around it. Well, when people think that emotions are supposed to be separate, they like literally don't have the whole wide world of their mind that they can sail through. And they're like, 
go the wrong places. <laughs> We're talking about traders. A lot of the work you do is just traders, but it's also with athletes. I mean, it's with anyone that's facing decision, risk. So every decision is a risk decision. Just some are more complex than others. So all of life. I mean, I, yeah, I have lots of people besides investors and traders, art gallery owners, music producers, Broadway directors. Yeah. We all get stuck. Well, that makes me feel slightly better. So Hugh was really interesting. Hugh Hendry, uh, always provocative. Uh, long time has has a lot of experience and and is someone that struck me as really uh, very self reflective and of course uh, you've had a conversation with Hugh you know Hugh Hugh we have permission to talk about him in this way um, and one of the things that came up with him and I laughed I, when he said it I thought gosh this this could be a t shirt um, or or like a tagline for something but one of the things one of the themes that he surfaced has come up in every conversation that we've had so far in addition to you know, them talking about emotion. And this is the idea or the frustration around getting so married to a trader idea that they stayed in it too long. They stayed with it, even if it, if it was something that was obviously not working or turning against them and, and just stewing about this. I mean, in some of these trades are 20 years later, they remember the exact circumstances of the trade and, and why they got so stuck in it. Let's, let's listen to a, a clip of how Hugh describes that experience himself. I've always chaptered this profound and disturbing episode in my life as the, I've ordained it as the, the arrogance and the conceit of a well-formed argument, that I was blinkered to the reality that the thing was going down. It's, it's more important that you keep an inventory, a reserve of fantastically good ideas, but you keep them on the top shelf. That's, all, that's only, I don't even know if that's half of the business. The, the real value I did is knowing when to, you know, put that arm up and bring it down and plug it into the portfolio. You know, it's just the combination of the two. Never fall in love with these things. Never fall in love with the intellectual basis of what you're proposing. First of all, I, I, I love anyone who says I was blinkered to the idea. I'm totally stealing that phrase. But the arrogance and conceit of a well-formed argument. W what do you think he's getting at there? So I think, you know, when I first heard it, I was like, so what is arrogance, really? Like, I know more? Um, conceit, like, I'm better than? But I think two things. First, uh, that's an intellectual defense. Actually, it it makes sense because we live in a world that interprets everything through cognition. So he's sort of describing how he behaved, but he doesn't really realize that it's not why he behaved the way that he did. Um, and this is true basically for anyone who stays in any losing trade. When you look at the idea that underneath the surface, you are predicting some future emotion. So if you, you know, hear the whole story, he was in kind of a difficult situation. He felt it was absolutely necessary to prove himself, to do something dramatic for the firm to notice him and like him. So he essentially had to prove how smart he was. And this was really important to him at the time. I mean, he says he broke up with his girlfriend, you know, that he was in a difficult situation. It sounded like they had kind of ostracized him. So like he had to get it right. So what was really going on was he was afraid of what would happen if he didn't get it right. He ironically, he thinks he was arrogant. He's so sure he was right. But in re what was driving him and made him unable to see that he was incorrect was the fear of what would happen if he actually was incorrect. You know, it's what behavioral finance would call confirmation bias, but like call it, yeah, it is confirmation bias, but it's this underlying prediction of what you're going to feel if you have to admit you were wrong. And that's more powerful than like anything else. So that that's wild. So it's it's almost like y the inability to face the fear that you're the possibility that you're going to fail marries you to the idea because you're just like I'm just going to stay with this cuz it has to work because I'm so afraid of what's behind door 2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it, like you can't face the potential it's oftentimes regret or, or humiliation and embarrassment. Like you can't you, you, you don't want to imagine how embarrassed you're going to be 
or humiliated you're going to be or what the consequences are, you know, and the consequences meaning how unhappy you're going to be by, you know, making the people who care about this disappointed in you. So it's interesting. Someone I, I just taped with someone um, and tell me if this is a that maybe they were doing it the right way, who said it was risky and they were scared about doing the trade, but then thought to themselves, is this a trade that would be worth getting fired for? So if I'm going to get fired, would this, would this be a trade that would be worth it? <laughs> and, and the answer was yes, <laughs> and, and they did it. Um, and so that, that to me seems like kind of the opposite where they uh, like recognize the fear, recognize that it could be career ending, and then made a decision, you know, sort of cuddled up to that. Uh, am I still okay with it? That sounds like someone who actually was a little bit more cognizant. Totally, of totally. They actually used that. They actually said the worst possible case is something I'd be willing to risk. I.e., the worst possible case isn't that threatening to me compared to the possible reward. And if someone does that honestly, because you know someone could sort of talk themselves into that when it's not really true. Yeah. But assuming they're doing it honestly, chances are that trade works really well. So. It's interesting to me that he said the other thing he said in that is that don't fall in love with the intellectual idea. So he used a really strong emotion to describe, uh, you know, the connection to the intellectual, except you're saying it wasn't intellectual at all. It was it was fear based, really. I mean, there was an intellectual, not the trade, not why he took the trade, but the fact he stayed in it. Because he kept doubling down, doubling down. This is, for those of you who listen, this is Hughes Reader's Digest tray that went spectacular. You know, just, just they finally had to sort of, you know, take, take tap him on the show shoulder. him out, the perver- basically. The tap, tap him, him on, on the shoulder. shoulder. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, that's one of the things about cognition and intellect analysis versus emotion. There's all kinds of phrases that are reflective of emotion, like never fall in love. I mean, what does it mean to be in love with someone? You know, you're like obsessed with them, like they're wonderful, they're perfect, this is great. You like don't see reality, right? And so it's a, it is a, refle- it is a, a not irrelevant phrase. Um, and you don't want to lose them. I mean, really, that's the essence of why he said never fall in love. Is because you, when you're in love, you don't want to lose the person. So you really don't want this trade to go bad. Because why? In either case, it's going to be really darn painful. So I was thinking about there is the other reason this was really interesting to me is that there seems to be, you know, four people who are successful who do these trades. And, you know, many of them have, you know, had sort of stories where there was a lot of doubt, a lot of doubters around them, a lot of people who didn't see what they saw. And they, you know, for some for some of them, hugely successful. What is the difference between conviction and stubbornness of staying in a trade for too long? Well, it, it, I'm going to go to Hugh's case in, in one sense. At that time, when he was 27, he didn't understand that the market really is a social game. Like, you have your analysis, but basically other people in the market need to, to get on board with your analysis or they're never going to you know, buy or sell whatever you need them to do. Like you're in it and then you need other people to see it. Otherwise, the price isn't going to change. Right. So as people grow and experience in the market, they start to realize it's not the analysis. It's like their competence in other people seeing this over time. So they support the direction of the position. So he didn't get that. Um, The other thing that happens is, you know, when you go through some of these serious losses and you survive them, you start to believe like you can have a prediction that it will be all right. Like the person who just said, I'll get fired over this, because whoever said that realized that if they got fired, they would still be okay for whatever reason. So that's that comes with experience. Actually, I think Hugh. We, I think Hugh did did talk about that, about about it being a social game, but he didn't. I don't know that he exactly used that the that language. And I think it was when I was asking him about being a contrarian. So uh, throughout, I mean, even starting then, you know, he thought he found that idea that no one else saw. But he he did does have a reputation as being somebody who is contrarian, who will go against the flow. Um, and when I asked him that, he sort of kind of redefined it and was like, no, I'm not really being a contrarian. Let, let's let's play a clip of him talking about that and about his reputation as being a contrarian. 
So why, why would I seek to outsmart the smartest minds on the planet? That kind of sounds like a, a poor risk return trade-off. And instead, what I, I sought to do was I sought to understand why even being super, super intelligent, you aren't guaranteed to make money in the crazy upside world of risk taking. And so when, when all these smart people were throwing their hands up, because arguably they'd consumed too much of the insanity molecules, um, and they said, who would have guessed that this could happen? And I was like, me. So that that was really interesting to me. So is that when you're talking about mark the market as a social game, is that what you're talking about? That he at some point was able to sort of see something else going on or really key into that social part of it? Well, it really is just that you need other market players to come to your perception or some perception that causes them to trade in the same way, you know, buy some, but you need them to do that. Um, and he could basically see that, that the predictions people were making were incomplete. Uh, so that while they may be moving, you know, an asset's price in a certain direction based on some idea, that idea was like missing things that were right in front of them. And he was basically predicting that, you know, other market participants would come to see those things that he could see, you know, right in front of himself. And they should be able to see, but they weren't seeing. Uh, so what does that mean? He can get into a trade early at, at a good price. And, but he's predict it's called theory of mind, by the way, in psychology, that you have a theory of the other person's mind. So he was operating out of a theory of like, look, they're like using group think, you know, they're not seeing it. You know, maybe they're just all fundamentals as opposed to any global macro influences or any technical influences. It's funny because herd mentalities are a really powerful thing in markets. I mean, we do s tend to see why are we so all so susceptible to that? Because I'm assuming even the best traders fall victim to that. Because he talked about even the hedge funds, the hot, most highly paid fund managers in the world, who are supposed to be the smartest people out there, sometimes ha drank too many insanity molecules, he called them, I think. <laughs> well, you know, at its core, like this we always have an emotion that's about a future emotion. You know, we feel confident that we will, this will work and we'll be happy and safe. Like that's really what it's about. So, and happy and safe, like has a social component, right? I won't be ostracized from my community. My spouse won't divorce me. Like I'll have, you know, um, so there's safety in numbers. Like people get confused. There's safety in numbers. I mean, and you need numbers to support your position. It's like a timing thing. You know, you need to be different from the crowd at the beginning, but then you need the crowd to come along with you. But you can't confuse those two. And I've had clients, I mean, hedge fund managers who had like such a need to be recognized by their peers or um, to feel like they were in the trade their peers were in, that they'd literally do mm -hmm. th take major positions where they just threw out whatever their process was. It's funny that the need for belonging, it always comes up in sort of HR speak and, you know, belonging and inclusion is a big, you know, a, a big trend now in human resources. But and people sometimes don't like it, but it is so it sounds like you're saying it's so primitive to we, we all feel that. Yeah, yeah. I think I mean, you know, Denise Scholl's theory of like human beings is we have two competing needs. One is to like be fully ourselves and reach our potential. And the other is to be part of a group and accepted and loved and they're in conflict. And so we're always navigating those two. And the market, honestly, is the perfect place to navigate those two. <laughs> Why is that? Well, because it, it is an authority figure. Like you can't, nobody can change the price, right, really. George Soros and the silver trader, whatever, notwithstanding. So you can't do anything to influence it. Um, and so what you do, you project onto it like authority figures from your life, you know, you project onto it your storylines from when you were a little kid and you had no influence over what happened to you or very little influence over, you know, whatever situations your parents put you in. Uh, and you interpret it through that. Um, you can, like, 
do what he does and, you know, step out and look at the factors that are influencing price at any one day and say, these are really wrong and these are really going to change. And when everybody else realizes they're going to change, they're going to come along with me. So he's gotten to be himself and then he's gotten the support. Like, and so he's met both of those needs. And you just, I mean, it's a tick by tick assault on your ego that you can like apply any interpretation to that you want or that's embedded in you because of your life history. So, I mean, that that feeling that even with all that experience that we gravitate to being in, in that group with others to get that sense of belonging, I think it must affect everyone. It does. I mean, like you, you end up getting back to the sphere of regret, future regret, and like, will you be humiliated or uh, embarrassed or really unsafe? It's like we're always predicting are we safe or, un, or unsafe. Our body's always doing that. Our psyche's always doing that. Everything is like at its very core. Does it feel good or bad? Will it feel good or bad? Like, so, you know, if you really are outside the group at any one point, you know, you might be at really great risk. And so you get nervous about really being outside the group at any one point. You mentioned something a moment ago about, uh, like, the authority figure of the market. And we sort of layer on that whatever, you know, issues we had when we were growing up with authority or our thoughts about that. And the issue of... uh, of childhood came up when we were talking to Hugh and I was, I really appreciated his honesty and willing to talk about his past because I think he does recognize that it played a role. Um, But he talked about uh, his childhood, childhood growing up poor, by the way, a lot of the people we've talked to came from nothing, which is very interesting to me, but he talked about growing up poor and the kind of impact it had on him. Let's listen to what he said. My parents were, given the opportunity to buy housing stock, you know, from the, from the government um, at below market because they couldn't afford market. And, and so we moved from that housing project to another housing project, which had more green space. Um, and my parents purchased a house and they were already showing ominous signs of of worrying at the most minute things and and taking on debt just, just sent them over the edge and you 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 pick you pick all that tension up as a, as a child and and so i i channeled i channeled their tension and like if you fast forward into the person i became the person i i, I made a career of sorts around hedge fund management um I was a worrier and I chose an occupation where you worry a lot, but you get remunerated for worrying. So child is like, like everyone, child is uh, features very, very prominently in the, in the hard wiring of, of who I became. It's all about our childhood. Is it? I mean, it, it is the stereotypical therapy issue, but it was really fascinating. And I, I was wor- wondering at the time if you could swap out worry for anxiety um, because everybody worries, but it sounded like it was pretty persistent. And just that concern over over money and finance, it is kind of interesting that he ended up going into that field as opposed to something else. You know, he talked earlier about um, being before he was seven years old and like this essentially dangerous environment yes. that his parents had been rejected And so I think like a couple of things go on there where like when you're an outsider growing up and also I think in his case, you can, you can imagine that his parents were working all the time. So he was probably more or less on his own. And obviously he's a brilliant person. He was born with an intellect. Well, you're like, you're a little kid. It's kind of dangerous. You just kind of got to figure it out. And you're not part of any group that's going to save you. So what does that enable you to do? It enables you to see things more realistically. It ends see things that other people don't see. Um, it gives you a confidence in yourself because you have to do it over and over and over again. You don't have like, you know, a mother or father or a big social, you know, family structure that's saying, do this, do that, do this, do that. And like, you're just walking through the steps. You're like navigating risk as a little kid. Um, so I think that ends up playing into why the market was so attractive, because that's just the most extreme version of that, like figure out the forces that are causing people to do what they're doing. And oh, by the way, you can make a bunch of money doing that. 
Yeah. Um, and the rejection, the being rejected, like not part of a group, led to what? His being able to be contrarian, to see it differently than mm-hmm. other people. But if I were talking to him, I would propose that his ability to see the world and navigate risk in a more objective way, if you will, than the masses is actually outweighs his worrying. So it's kind of a superpower. Yeah. So he might perceive himself as always worrying, but clearly he couldn't have done some of the trades he's done if he was, you know, consumed with anxiety. One of the questions I ask all the time is, um, because I'm interested, how did you get into this field? You know, did you know about markets and, you know, was money important in your household? Did you know there was a thing such as, you know, investing? Was it talked about in your house? And so often the answer, I mean, there are some exceptions, but so often the answer is no, like no financial literacy, no idea, no money, which is financial insecurity is, I wonder if that was it deficit or is that something that not only sort of propelled them and and was a motivator but also gave them some sort of vision or some ability to understand things outside that other people don't i think when you feel unsafe growing up i mean there's obviously a point maybe that this tips into you know too much trauma but you generally are you just don't necessarily feel like you have a place in the world and you're sort of on the outside and you can't fully participate in the world uh, because you don't have the money, um, your parents don't have the money, it, it tends to give you a perspective on the world that you otherwise don't get if you grow up, you know, in an, an environment where you're given everything. It, I think it can be a plus in terms of ultimately navigating markets. I think that's probably a relief for some people to hear because I think that a lot of people consider a difficult childhood uh, a deficit, a problem uh, to paper over. In most cases, I mean, this is a a gross generalization, but still, there are a lot of cases, let's put it that way, where, you know, within a certain boundary, right, of of you have to think for yourself, but you're not too, too, too unsafe, um, you develop confidence in yourself. It's so true. I think about uh, we we hear there's a whole sort of generation, a group of of uh, people who were very young in in World War, right in Europe, um, and obviously the society was pulled apart, and many of them were on their own or pretty close to being on their own, or and one and and many of them went on to be very very successful CEOs and run companies because at a young age they were sort of you know having to fend for themselves basically. You know when you have really attentive parents. You know, the kids, this is again a gross generalization, but they tend to not get as much credit for what they're capable of. But like, you know, you can say to an eight-year-old, like, you know, some people believe one thing about God and some people believe another thing about God. And the eight-year-old will say, okay. <laughs> like, they won't get all caught up in it. It's like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. We don't really know. Some people think, and they're, they're fine, and they'll go back off doing what they're doing. But the adults will have to be like, no, you have to believe, like, the way I, like, you know, they just look at, they look at the world like kind of more the way it is. Mm. They're smart. Yeah, because they haven't been indoctrinated into our bullshit yet. <laughs> exactly. And so the, the the more like that lack of indoctrination allows you to then like navigate markets in a way that if you were really indoctrinated, you have to unlearn that. So it's interesting. So we 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 have this insight about his background, but I was thinking about it. Um, and struck by it when he talked about uh, making a trade around the great financial crisis, the housing bust. And he this was he was right, right? This was one of his better trades. But it's it, with you, the good and bad were all mixed together because even if you made a boatload of money, there were sometimes things he pulled out of it that he thought were lessons to learn, sort of, you know, of things that went wrong and vice versa on a bad trade, things that he pulled out that he thought were great. So, but in the, in this, even though he was right and, and made the right call in terms of money, he talked about the aftermath, about being so, um, I think he called it being pious, outspoken, and just so angry after that. Let's Let's listen to what he said. I became a very pious, outspoken commentator 
on what had come to pass. Um, and and very, I was I was trading outside the reach of my engagement for my clients. I was I'd become a social an angry, which is anger is emotion, and I was so I was an, an emotional commentator on on social mood and trend and I was trying to provide transparency to what happened but also I, I wanted more retribution um, I, I you know, there had been malfeasance uh, and I I didn't want this nonsense to happen again um, and I lost myself um, and worse than that I, I lost you know at least two years of what should have been great performance. So when I was listening to him say that, um, I first of all, when he said he lost himself, I was thinking he meant control of his ability to keep his emotion in check. But uh, he, at the same time, talks about just the fury and anger and the need for retribution, which I thought was you know, very honest of him, but then also saying, I wanted transparency. I, there was something was wrong. I wanted justice. I wanted to warn people. Th those seem like two, two slightly different things to me. Yeah, it's really interesting uh, reaction on his part. And I mean, the truth is, I'd love the three of us to chat more about it because there's something I can see entangled with his own experience of being in that violent environment and then being given a house and then his parents worrying so much where I feel like, you know, he used the word time traveling in the markets, but he was doing this time traveling of his own emotions. Like what, if, what would have happened if my parents lost the house? You know, what, what would happen if this were my childhood now mm -hmm. and they would have lost mm -hmm. the house. And I don't think he was so worried about himself. I think he was, protective of them and probably the feelings he had when he was a little kid where he wanted to make it okay because kids do that they, they like they want the problem to be their fault so that they can make it okay and it helps them it's like a narcissistic thing but it makes them feel like they have some control I think that got merged into that in some way shape or form um and he was sort of angry about what happened to other people but as a reflection of what his parents were worried about this comes up over and over again. Episodes, um, you know, from when people were young or experiences that you can see are carrying through because they bring them up. Like they make the connection, but then there's something that's not complete about that connection that that is eluding them from really understanding what happened. And I keep going back to what you said at the beginning that we – Con, you know, we conflate like emotion and doing and the emotion is tied up in the action, but we're not really separating them out and sort of fully understanding what's happening and what, what if there was a direct reaction, like there's something is blurred in all of that, I think. When you really sit down with someone and figure out like why they feel the way that they do, you trace like what their storyline and what the feelings would have been like at important moments in their first 15, 20 years. Um, and then you, you usually when you really trace that objectively, you can see how it matches to the experience they've had. And so there's something in this and how it ended up making him so angry. There's like a missing puzzle piece in that. Do we understand or do we try to avoid how those early experiences influence us? Why, why does that seem to be a wall that we put up? It depends on the person. So some people like really want to know because they really want to know why they do what they do and they want to do more of, you know, what helps them be whoever they are. But, you know, a lot of people are afraid of it because they're, they're first of all, they're afraid to just feel the feeling. Like if I actually let myself feel like the fear or frustration or disappointment from when I grew up, they, they're like afraid they'll like, you know, evaporate. Like that somehow the feeling will overtake them. It's not that way. That's powerful. Yeah, yeah, it's really powerful. powerful. They're really afraid of actually even feeling the feeling, never mind analyzing it. Is that because we shut it off when we were young because it was too much to bear then and, and we just never let ourselves fully, fully experience it, it, it? You know, for a variety of reasons, but oftentimes you were told to shut it off, right? Um, but also children can have feelings that they're, that they are scared of, like, if a child gets really angry, they might just shut it off because they're actually afraid of what they'll do. 
it's like often that, that you, you were told you couldn't feel it. And as a kid, you were afraid of what would happen if you did feel it. So you just stopped feeling it. And then you retain both those things, afraid to feel it and re- afraid of what you'll have to do if you realize it. And it stops you. But that like really limits growth. Cause, like, just to be clear, I just have to say this and I know you. Like, the neuroscience now says our perception and judgment is all predictive, meaning we're constantly predicting what's going to happen and we're doing it based on our past experience. And the past experience in the formative years are the most important pieces. If the perception and judgment has anything to do with like who we are and how safe we are and how successful we are, self image, which most things do. I mean, what you're going to order for lunch doesn't, but any sort of trade does. Yeah. When you're talking about being predictive, it's just like like the next five minutes, something's going to happen and, and it's going to be good or bad kind of thing. Like it's always trying to look around the corner. Your brain is sometime, somehow trying to predict what's ahead so that you're well or you do well or you move through life well or that you're. You At know. its core, yes. Yeah. Safe or unsafe. But literally the la- latest perception and judgment research is that it's not stimulus response. That right now, you and I are predicting the next words each other is going to say. We're anticipating. Our eyesight is looking to work that way. Like everything that we thought was, you know, get some sort of input and react. It's looking like that's completely wrong. Wild. That's wild. I mean, it's literally the sun rises in the east of human perception. Once you accept that, it changes how you interpret everything that humans do and how you interpret what the problems are and how you solve them. It's like flat earth, round earth. Now you can sail around the world of your mind. So if we take all of these themes, I think, tie back into this this big, you know, bombshell that you just dropped, flat earth, round earth, that everything's predictive and most of it's unconscious. How do we start to, I mean, I know what this is, you spend hours and hours and hours working with people to try to uncover this, but what do we... You know, what should be the takeaway from this conversation in terms of what we need to think about in terms of recognizing that within ourselves? Yeah, I I tell people, you know, this simple question, what am I feeling and why am I feeling it? Which is a simple question to say. It is not an easy question for most people to answer. And it's harder to get both sides even right. The real what and the real why. But you're also like going with the flow. So if you commit to trying to do it, chances are you're going to get further down the river of that, if you will, than if you don't. Um, But basically, when you get both sides right, what and why, first of all, whatever agitation of the feelings there are, doesn't matter. And second of all, you have a world's worth of information that you didn't have, which what then opens up your choices in any realm of life. But um, And it enables you at, at the very core to separate the feelings that are urging you to do something like an impulsive trade, the ones you're supposed to control your emotions and and not from the ones that are in intuition. I mean, expertise, Mm. you know, expertise that comes from what education experience is delivered to your consciousness through a feeling, not a thought. You sense something is right because you're, you know, you're having a pattern recognition experience based on like your past experience saying, this is what's going to happen. These are how these factors are going to play out because you've seen this movie before, you know, a phrase that people use Mm -hmm. in the market. But that information is delivered like below the neck, in a sense, a feeling like it's not delivered up here. You don't go, when you feel intuitive or recognize something, it doesn't, you know, Hugh talked about voices in his head, but like it doesn't come up here. It comes here. Yeah, which is, which again, we're going to sort of end on where we started. Don't say you need to take the emotion out of it. Like strike that from the vocabulary because that's the core of everything. I had a CIO of a $50 billion fund say to me last year, you know what I think you're teaching me and what I now realize I have tried so hard to take the emotion out of it that I lost my access to my intuition. I was like, bingo. Wow. Because that's where it lives. That is that is what intuition is. It's just, you know, the message delivery of your emotions. It, like, you can take it. I gave a workshop recently, and there were some quants in it. And I said, okay, guys, like, you can do all this advanced math that, you know, I could never do. But let's talk about it. Someone gives you a problem that you can solve with math somehow. Um, what's the first thing you do? 
Like you look at the parameters of the problem and you think to yourself, like you have a sense of the right math to apply. And they were like, well, yeah. I'm like, uh, that sense of the right math to apply is called intuition. <laughs> and you have it because you have education and experience in which math to apply. And I would go, I don't know. I don't have a clue, right? Because I have no experience, maybe a little education, but no experience in any advanced math. So I have no feeling about it. And they were all like, they had a feeling about what the right thing to do is. And that's the way it is with anybody in their realm of expertise everywhere all the time. So we're totally going to make a T-shirt that says "Quants have feelings too." <laughs> that will be that will that will be one of our T-shirts at the at the end of this. <laughs> um, Denise, it's been an absolute pleasure, and we're going to do it again. We're going to and thanks very much to Hugh for letting us sort of use some of his stories as well as a sort of launching pad to dig into some of this. He's yeah. the best. <laughs> thanks for having me. All right, that's a wrap on this week's edition of My Life in Four Trades. For more on the series, visit realvision.com forward slash my life in four trades. Make sure to use the numeral four. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. If you like this show, you're going to love Real Vision Essential. At Real Vision, we talk to the most successful investors in the world and deliver videos that make finance interesting. It's all about helping you become a better, more confident investor. Now, we could dress that up in fancy marketing buzzwords, but it's really that simple. Oh, and right now, you can join Essential for $99 for a full year instead of the usual $239. Visit realvision.com forward slash Essential99 to join the Real Vision community. That's realvision.com forward slash Essential99.